Hi, I'm Sue. Thanks for joining me for today's Bible reading. We will be reading in the book of Micah, one of the minor prophets, minor in duration only, in word count, not in importance. Um, you're wise to be taking time to deposit the word in your heart. I'm sure you know that. It's more vital to us than our daily diet and exercise, right? Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. So at the end of the video, I'll tell you more about um, the broadcast and how to get your free one-year Bible about the playlist and the educational opportunities on this channel. You can also find that information down in the description. So let me start today with Micah just reading you the headings. It's a short book. Let's get kind of a framework in our mind. And while I'm talking about framework, be sure to also check in the description for the link for the Micah overview that's posted on the channel so that you can get a good introduction too. In fact, you may want to go listen to that one first before um, going through the book. This book's going to be read in one ses setting, um, one sitting, however you want to say that, um, because it's short. And so I like that. I like getting it all at one time that way. So here are the headings for the book of Micah. Coming judgment on Israel. Micah's lament. Oppressors judged. God's word rejected. Oh, that breaks my heart. The remnant regathered. Unjust leaders judged. False prophets judged. Zion's destruction. The Lord's rule from restored Zion. And from exile to victory. Oh, there's more. From defeated ruler to conquering king. The glorious purified remnant. God's lawsuit against Judah, verdict of judgment, Israel's moral decline, Zion's vindication, Micah's prayer answered. And you know what? I don't usually do this, but I'm going to read them again because there's multiple of them. And I don't know about you. Um, I hope you don't mind me doing that because I like to have a framework in my mind. That way when we're reading through, I just have a better, <clears throat> I don't know, I, I remember it better and I, I comprehend it better. So I'll read them, but I'll read them a little bit faster. Coming judgment on Israel, Micah's lament, that's like a mourning, grieving, um, oppressors judged, God's word rejected, the remnant regathered, unjust leaders judged, false prophets judged, Zion's destruction, the Lord's rule from restored Zion, from exile to victory, from defeated ruler to conquering king, the glorious and purified remnant, that's good news. God's lawsuit against Judah, verdict of judgment, Israel's moral decline, Zion's vindication, Micah's prayer answered, and that's it. So that sounds like a lot, but again, it's a short book. Hold on one sec. Okay, that was a pause for me to turn off the noisy air conditioner right next to me. Thanks for your patience. All right, starting in chapter one. Verse 1 for Micah. You might hear a little bit of clicking noise. I'm reading from the uh, Word doc here in the background since I'm doing audio only today. So this is a reading from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. The word of the Lord that came to Micah the Morishite, what he saw regarding Sumeria and Jerusalem in the days of, just a second, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah. Now, if you did the introduction with me, you know those are the three kings that we're going to focus on in here. Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And also, I'm pretty sure all three of those are in the book of Kings. <clears throat> so you can find them there. Uh, kings and Chronicles, more than likely. So Samaria and Jerusalem are the capitals. Samaria is the capital of Israel in the north, and Jerusalem is the capital of Judah in the south. So just... Okay, I'm going to try not to talk a lot through this. Um, well, I always say that, but I'll try to talk more afterwards. But I just wanted to repeat that so we have a good foundation here. So verse 1, the word of the Lord that came to Micah the Morishite, what he saw regarding Samaria and Jerusalem in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. That's kings of southern Judah. I mean the southern kingdom, not Israel in the north. So I don't understand that because Samaria is Israel in the north and Jerusalem is in Judah in the south. But the kings they mention are only the kings of Judah in the south. So that's just something to note, a question. Remember, I always say the questions are good because then when we come across the answer, we'll recognize it. Okay, so I'm going to leave that question hanging out there. It's also a point of study for later when we want to study and not just read. 
Verse 2. Listen, all you peoples. Pay attention, earth, and everyone in it. The Lord God will be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. Look, the Lord is leaving his place and coming down to trample the heights of the earth. The mountains will melt beneath him, and the valleys will split apart, like wax near a fire, like water cascading down a mountainside. All this will happen because of Jacob's rebellion and the sins of the house of Israel. What is the rebellion of Jacob? Isn't it Samaria? And what is the high place of Judah? Isn't it Jerusalem? Therefore I will make Samaria a heap of ruins in the countryside, a planting area for a vineyard. I will roll her stones into the valley and expose her foundations. All her carved Im images will be smashed to pieces. All her wages will be burned in the fire, and I will destroy all her idols. Since she collected the wages of a prostitute, they will be used again for a prostitute. Micah's Lament Because of this I will lament and wail. I will walk barefoot and naked. I will howl like the jackals and mourn like ostriches. For her wound is incurable and has reached even Judah. It has approached the gate of my people as far as Jerusalem. Don't announce it in Gath. Don't weep at all. Roll in the dust in Beth Lepra. Depart in shameful nakedness, you residents of Shafir. The residents of Zanan will not come out. Beth Ezel is lamenting. Its support is taken from you. This is interesting because, um, here I go talking when I said I wasn't going to, but it's just so good. <laughs> it's good to say it, I guess, when it comes to mind. But do you notice that all these, these cities are going to be affected by the, by the destruction of Samaria and, um, and Jerusalem? Because, of course, we're, you know, we, we trade, we interact with, with all the cities and countries around us, and they're all affected, everybody. So their, their sin, their rebellion, their destructiveness is what it is, um, is really hurting everyone. That's why God is, is forced to act in this way. And he's warning them first. In his great love and mercy, he's warning them. So it says, its support is taken from you. Though the residents of Maroth anxiously wait for something good, disaster has come from the Lord to the gate of Jerusalem. Harness the horses to the chariot, you residents of Lachish. This was the beginning of sin for daughter Zion, because Israel acts of rebellion can be traced to you. Therefore, send farewell gifts to Moresheth Gath. The houses of Oxib are a deception to the kings of Israel. I will again bring a conqueror against you who live in Marishah. The nobility of Israel will come to Adullam. Shave yourselves bald and cut off your hair in sorrow for your precious children. Make yourselves as bald as an eagle, for they have been taken from you into exile. How sad. Oppressors judged. Chapter 2. Woe to those who dream of wickedness and prepare evil plans on their beds. At morning light they accomplish it because the power is in their hands. They covet fields and seize them. They also take houses. They deprive a man of his home, a person of his inheritance. <clears throat> That's an eminent domain thing that we have in the U.S. now that wasn't here initially. Uh, therefore, there's so much that could be said about that, taking, taking the home and the property for, uh, that rightfully belongs to someone else and see what it says about it. Woe to those who dream up wickedness and prepare evil plans on their beds. At morning light, they accomplish it because the power is in their hands, because they can, because somehow these evil people have gotten into power. They covet fields and seize them. They also take houses like Jezebel. They deprive a man of his home and a person of his inheritance. Therefore, the Lord says, I am now planning a disaster against this nation. You cannot free your necks from it. Then you will not walk so proudly, because it will be an evil time. In that day, one will take up a taunt against you and a lament, mournfully saying, We are totally ruined. He measures out the allotted land of my people, how he removes it from me. He allots our fields to traitors. Therefore, there will be no one in the assembly of the Lord to divide the land by casting lots. See, this tells me God can divvy up land and distribute it however he wants to, but he doesn't allow us to do that. He can take away what he's given. <clears throat> It's kind of like he's the only one that has the right to take life or even create life. God's word rejected. Quit your preaching, they preach. They should not preach these things. Shame will not overtake us. House of Jacob, should it be asked, is the spirit of the Lord impatient? Are these things he does, excuse me, are these the things he does? Don't my words bring good to the one who walks uprightly? But recently my people have risen up like an enemy. You strip off the splendid robe from those who are passing through confidently, like those returning from war. 
You force the women of my people out of their comfortable homes, and you take my blessing from their children forever. These are things that, that get under God's skin, right? <clears throat> In interrupting people's inheritances, it's one reason he hates divorce. Um, that was the problem with taking fields or taking things from people that don't belong. Even David, when he took Bathsheba, you know, he interrupted uh, an entire family line there and took what wasn't his. Very destructive. Uh, let's see. Um, and of course, God can redeem. You know, when I said that about divorce, that's one of the things I, I regret about uh, my divorce um, that I didn't want and didn't feel like I had a choice in. But, you know, the damage that it does, it's, it's heartbreaking and, and God hates that. But you know what? He has a way of restoring. And that's really what this this whole book is about. It ends up with the good news. It ends up with, you know, repentance and for those who do repent and the remnant who's restored and restored better than before. So that's our hope for all of us that have been through some brokenness. God is faithful and he's able. able. If we've given our life to Jesus, submitted to him, we just need to trust him. He's going to work it out. He's going to make it work. That's so true. I can think of, you know, I can think of 20 different situations with people I know that, you know, God has and will come through for them. So that was a little rabbit trail of encouragement. Um, where did I leave off? It says, recently my people have risen up like an enemy. You strip off the splendid robe from those who, who are passing through confidently, like those returning from war. You force the women of my people out of their comfortable homes, and you take my blessing from their children forever. Get up and leave, for this is not your place of rest, because defilement brings destruction a grievous destruction. If a man of wind, excuse me, if a man of wind comes and invents lies, quote, I will preach to you about wine and beer, unquote, he would be just the preacher for this people. The remnant gathered. I will indeed gather all of you, Jacob. I will collect the remnant of Israel. I will bring them together like sheep in a pen, like a flock in the middle of its fold. It will be noisy with people. One who breaks open the way will advance before them. They will break out, pass through the gate, and leave by it. Their king will pass through before them, the Lord as their leader. Unjust leaders judge. Chapter 3. Then I said, Now listen, leaders of Jacob, you rulers of the house of Israel. Aren't you supposed to know what is just? You hate good and love evil. You tear off people's skin and strip their flesh from their bones. You eat the flesh of my people after you strip their skin from them and break up their bones. You chop them up like flesh for the cooking pot, like meat in a cauldron. Then they will cry out to the Lord, but he will not answer them. He will hide his face from them at that time because of the crimes they have committed. False prophets judged. This is what the Lord says concerning the prophets who lead my people astray, who proclaim peace when they have food to sink their teeth into, but declare war against the one who puts nothing in their mouths. Therefore it will be night for you without visions. It will grow dark for you without divination. The sun will set on these prophets, and the daylight will turn black over them. Then the seers will be ashamed and the diviners disappointed. They will all cover their mouths because there will be no answer from God. As for me, however, I am filled with power by the Spirit of the Lord with justice and courage to proclaim to Jacob his rebellion and to Israel his sin. I love that part. I had to read that part again and highlight it. As for me, however, I am filled with power by the Spirit of the Lord with justice and courage to proclaim to Jacob his rebellion and to Israel his sin. Zion's Destruction Listen to this, leaders of the house of Jacob, you rulers of the house of Israel, who abhor justice and pervert everything that is right, who build Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with injustice. Her leaders issue rulings for a bribe, her priests teach for payment, and her prophets practice divination for money. <coughs> Excuse me. Yet they lean on the Lord, saying, Isn't the Lord among us? No disaster will overtake us. Therefore, because of you, Zion, because of you, Zion will be plowed like a field. Jerusalem will become ruins, and the hill of the Temple Mount will be a thicket. The Lord's rule from restored Zion. Chapter 4. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be established at the top of the mountains and will be raised above the hills. People will stream to it, and many nations will come and say, Come, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us about his ways, so we may walk in his paths. There's a great memory verse right there. He will teach us about his ways, so we may walk in his paths. That is 4.2, Micah 4.2. For instruction will go out from Zion in the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will settle disputes among many peoples and provide arbitration for strong nations that are far away. 
They will beat their swords into plows and their spears into pruning knives. Nation will not take up the sword against nation, and they will never again train for war. Does that sound familiar? But each man will sit under his grapevine and under his fig tree with no one to frighten him. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has promised this. Though all the people each walk in the name of their gods, we will walk in the name of Yahweh our God forever and ever. On that day, this is the Lord's declaration, I will assemble the lame and gather the scattered those I have injured. I will make the lame into a remnant, those far removed into a strong nation. Then the Lord will rule over them in Mount Zion from this time and forever. And you, watchtower for the flock, fortified hill of daughter Zion, the former rule will come to you. Sovereignty will come to daughter Jerusalem. From exile to victory. Now, why are you shouting loudly? Is there no king with you? Has your counselor perished so that anguish grips you like a woman in labor? Writhe and cry out, daughter Zion, like a woman in labor. For now you will leave the city and camp in the open fields. You will go to Babylon. There you will be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you from the power of your enemies. Many nations have now assembled against you. They say, let her be defiled and let us feast our eyes on Zion. But they do not know the Lord's intentions or understand his plan, that he has gathered them like sheaves to the threshing floor. Rise and thresh, daughter Zion, for I will make your horns iron and your hooves bronze, so you can crush many people. Then you will set apart their plunder to the Lord for destruction, their wealth to the Lord of all the earth. From defeated ruler to conquering king. Chapter 5 Now daughter who is under attack, you slash yourself in grief, a siege is set against us. They are striking the judge of Israel on the cheek with a rod. Bethlehem Ephrathah, now listen, this is the, um, the Messianic prophecy. Uh, Micah 5 2. Bethlehem Ephrathah. Remember, Jesus was from Bethlehem, right? Born in Bethlehem. You are small among the clans of Judah. One will come from you to be ruler over Israel for me. His origin is from antiquity, from eternity. Therefore, he will abandon them until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers will return to the people of Israel. He will stand and shepherd them in the strength of Yahweh, in the majestic name of Yahweh his God. They will live securely, for then his greatness will extend to the ends of the earth. He will be their peace when Assyria invades our land. When it marches against our fortresses, we will raise against it seven shepherds, even eight leaders of men. They will shepherd the land of Assyria with the sword, the land of Nimrod with the drawn blade. So he will rescue us from Assyria when it invades our land, when it marches against our territory. The Glorious and Purified Remnant Then the remnant of Jacob will be among many people, like dew from the Lord, like showers on the grass. There's uh, several beautiful um, similes right here. You know, I'm sure you know similes are those comparisons using like or as. And a metaphor is the comparison that doesn't use like or as. So look here, it says... <clears throat> the remnant of Jacob will be among many peoples, like dew from the Lord, like showers on the grass which do not wait for anyone or linger for mankind. Then the remnant of Jacob will be among the nations among many peoples, like a lion among animals in the forest, like a young lion among flocks of the sheep, which tramples and tears as it passes through, and there is no one to rescue them. I love the similes of, and metaphors of the Bible. Your hand will be lifted up against adversaries, and your enemies will be destroyed. In that day, this is the Lord's declaration, I will remove your horses from you and wreck your chariots. I will remove the cities of your land and tear down your fortresses. I will remove sorceries from your hands, and you will not have any more fortune tellers. I will remove your carved images and sacred pillars, so that you will not bow down again to the work of your hands. I will pull up the Asherah poles from among you and demolish your cities. I will take vengeance and anger and wrath against the nations that have not obeyed me. Why? Okay, stop right there. Why? Because he's just this wrathful, demanding God? No. Because when you don't do it his way, people get hurt. Okay? Things get destroyed and damaged. Yes, that's upsetting to see people do that to other people and to destroy creation, to destroy the environment, and to just to hurt people and sacrifice their children and lie, steal, steal cheat, right? You, you name it. Um, all right, chapter six, God's law against Judah. Now listen to what the Lord is saying. Rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Listen to the Lord's lawsuit. Now remember, <clears throat> here it is about, um, now first of all, let me say, you can see it's going quickly because this is second to last chapter, and we're just breezing through it. It's a short book. And these are a form of uh, prose, I think we, we said during the introduction to Micah, the little overview that I did. Um, it's, you know, it's like a 
a form of poetry, sort of, or just the structure of uh, the form of prose, which doesn't necessarily come through in English, okay? <clears throat> Secondly, here, it's going to talk about the Lord's lawsuit, and this just goes with what I've been saying throughout all the major and minor prophets, that they seem to be um, as if they're being carried out in a, in a uh, court of law. There's the indictments against these uh, either countries or leaders um, or individuals, and um, the pronouncement of uh, what they need to do and the punishment if they don't, right? And I just want to, I'm sure I've said this before, but this principle is so important. It shows the long suffering of God. And again, people think of this, this wrathful, you know, angry God destroying nations left and right. Like he just, you know, sweeps his hand to just sweep people off the earth. And that's not what these scriptures show at all. They show a loving, just God and, and his, his long suffering um, his reason for going through these lawsuits is, is um, to let them know what they're doing and how they can correct it. And, and it gives time. This is one of the really important principles about time itself is that it gives a chance for repentance. It gives a chance to make a decision to turn to the Lord. And, and in this, in this presenting what's right over and over again, and God giving us an opportunity to choose, he's really winnowing the wicked from the, from the uh, righteous, those, those with a heart toward him even in our failure that we're willing to repent and turn to him for help and be dependent on him versus those that just harden their hearts and refuse, you know, the purely wicked. Um, and those are the ones that God's after to separate away um, from his beautiful and awesome creation. And it's just part of that bigger picture of redemption. So um, let's look at this, this case that he's going to plead now. So now uh, chapter six, now listen to what the Lord is saying. Rise, plead your case before the mountains and let the hills hear your voice. Listen to the Lord's lawsuit, you mountains and enduring foundations of the earth, because the Lord has a case against his people and he will argue it against Israel. See, and it's also proving God's justice, the purity of his love and justice, because he waits until, you know, it's absolutely certain that people are wicked, that they deserve their just cause, right? So it says, my people, what have I done to you? Or how have I wearied you? Testify against me. Indeed, I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from that place of slavery. I sent Moses, Aaron, Aaron and Miriam ahead of you. My people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, proposed, what Balaam, son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from the Acacia Grove to Gilgal, so that you may acknowledge the Lord's righteous acts. So see, now you can put a mark there to come back and study that later and go look and see what happened in those instances. That's uh, Micah 6, 5. What should I bring before the Lord when I come to bow before God on high? Should I come before him with burnt offerings, with year old calves? Would the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and tens of thousands of streams of oil? Should I give my firstborn for my transgression, the child of my body for my own sin? Mankind, he has told you what to do and what the Lord requires of you, to act justly, to love faithfulness, and to walk humbly with your God. It's that famous verse. Verdict of judgment. I'm still in the, in the court, right? Courtroom. The voice of Yahweh calls out to the city, and it is wise to fear your name. Pay attention to the rod and the one who ordained it. There's a memory verse. Pay attention to the rod and the one who ordained it. So let's so say to me, pay attention to God's ways, his, his, you know, the rod being the, um, the rules, the regulation, you know, the way, what we're instructed to do, pay attention. And the one who ordained it, you know, pay attention to the line we're supposed to walk or else, you know, destruction, right? Punishment. So it says, are there still the treasures of wickedness and the accursed short measure in the house of the wicked? Can I excuse wicked scales or bags of deceptive weights? There's God's justice. See, because how long, He'll, it seems like he'll let people get to this point of wickedness and then he'll act because he can't let the hurt and the destruction go on because every time in every nation, just go back and look as the, the wicked begin to take power, people get hurt more and more. And it's usually the innocent and the children, um, you know, it's just oppression and, and extortion and, and so on and so forth. So it says, um, the wealthy of the city, okay, can I excuse wicked scales and bags of deceptive weights? For the wealthy of the city are full of violence, and the residents speak lies. Their tongues and mouths are deceitful. As a result, I have begun to strike you severely, bringing desolation because of your sins. You will eat but not be satisfied. You will be hunger. There will be hunger within you. What you acquire, you cannot save, and what you do save, I will give to the sword. That is a curse right there. You will sow but not reap. You will press olives but not anoint yourself with oil. You will tread grapes but not drink the wine. The statutes of Omri and all the practices of Ahab's house have been observed. You have followed their policies. Therefore, see, God sees. He sees everything done in every dark corner. So it says, therefore, I will make you a desolate place and the city's residence an object of contempt. 
you will bear the scorn of my people. Last chapter. Israel's moral decline. How sad for me, for I am like one. When the summer, here's a simile, when the summer fruit has been gathered, after the gleaning of the grape harvest, finds no grape cluster to eat, no early fig which I crave. Godly people have vanished from the land, and there is no one upright among them. All of them wait in ambush to shed blood. They hunt each other with a net. Both hands are good at accomplishing evil. The official and the judge demand a bribe. When the powerful man communicates his evil desire, they plot it together. Does that sound familiar? The official and the judge demand a bribe. Plotting together. The best of them is like a briar, and the most upright is worse than the hedge of thorns. The day of your watchman, the day of your punishment, is coming. At this time, their panic is here. Do not rely on a friend. Don't trust a close companion. Seal your mouth from the woman who lies in your arms. Surely a son considers his father a fool and a daughter opposes her mother. You know, back when I, before I got saved and when I was in the world, you know, I didn't really trust a whole lot of people because I was a liar. And this was back when I was in like junior high and high school, but, um, I lied. And therefore a lot of times I suspected other people of lying. I don't do that anymore. I don't lie. I haven't lied in decades. And if I did tell even a white lie, I'm sure I went and confessed it because it bothers me. I don't do that. That's the grace of God in me and uh, the fear of God and, the, you know, just just so many little things like that. And I can recognize liars when I see them. But for the most part, I'm hanging around with people with that same heart. I'm not suspicious. I'm not, you know, I'm at peace. I'm at peace. Um, so anyway, that, I think that's what it's saying here that like nobody trusts each other because they're just all so wicked. And I see that today. People lie to their bosses. They lie to their spouses. They lie to their teachers and they don't think anything of it. You know, just tell your boss you're sick or just, you know, lie to the IRS or see what you can get away with. You know, lie to the police officer. Lie, 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 lie. Lie to your friend. You know, you don't want to go to their party. So you lie and tell them something. They're supposed to be your friend. You know, what kind of commitment do we have? What kind of integrity do we have? And the, I see this all around in our culture today. It's it's despicable. It's really despicable. And that's what this is talking about, that nobody trusts each other. The, the, the you know, children lie to their parents, the, the woman in your arms. So anyway, I could go on and on about that. It's a pet peeve. It's just our sin, y'all. And, uh, and I'm just so thankful for the grace of God that has, that has changed me and helps me every day. Um, Zion's vindication, verse eight, do not rejoice over me, my enemy, though I have fallen, I will stand up. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light because I have sinned against him. I must endure the Lord's rage until he argues my case and establishes justice for me. He will bring me into the light. That's just what I was saying. And I will see his salvation. Then my enemy will see, and she will be covered with shame. The one who said to me, where's the Lord, your God, my eyes will look at her in triumph. At that time, she will be trampled like mud in the streets. A day will come for rebuilding your walls. On that day, your boundary will be extended. On that day, people will come to you from Assyria and the cities of Egypt, even from Egypt to the Euphrates River, and from sea to sea and mountain to mountain. Then the earth will become a wasteland because of its inhabitants and as a result of their actions. Micah's prayer answered. Verse 14. Shepherd your people with your staff, the flock that is your possession. They live alone in a woodland surrounded by pastures. Let them graze in Bashan and Gilead as in ancient times. I will perform miracles for them as in the days of your exodus from the land of Egypt. Nation will see and be ashamed. All of their power, um, nation will see and be ashamed of all their power. They will put their hands over their mouths and their ears will become deaf. They will lick the dust like a snake and they will come trembling out of their hiding places like reptiles slithering on the ground. They will tremble in the presence of Yahweh our God. They will stand in awe of you. Who is a God like you, removing iniquity and passing over rebellion from the remnant of his inheritance? He does not hold on to his anger forever because he delights in faithful love. So that's what I'm saying. This, this whole book is, and all the major and minor prophets are about God's love and justice. Not his wrath. On, uh, it is and it isn't. It's because of love. It's his fierce love that makes him defend those things that are of value, right? So it says, he will again have compassion on us. He will vanquish our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will show loyalty to Jacob and faithful love to Abraham as you swore to our fathers from days long ago. And that's the end of the book of Micah. Okay, well, listen, please comment your thoughts about today's segment. I welcome your input. Then down in the description, you'll find great things like how to get your free copy of the One Year Bible. 
there are links for the playlist for the Bible reading so you can continuously listen and get that word hidden or embedded in your heart like we're instructed to do. Um, if you set up a YouTube premium account, you can listen in the background or when your screen is turned off. I love that aspect about uh, YouTube premium. And if you want to be notified when the next video launches, be sure to click subscribe with the bell. Until next time, God bless you. Thanks for joining.